your second introduction here and then we'll get started. Okay, thanks, uh, Ron. Uh, again, uh, please help me welcome uh, Rob uh, Bennett. Uh, Rob's one of the many uh, presenters we've uh, been lucky to have from the uh, Division 12, which is up in uh, Northeast uh, Ohio, Northwest uh, New York, Pennsylvania area. And um, uh, so uh, uh, thanks for taking your time today, Rob, for us, and uh, I'll let you take it away. <clears throat> okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay and, and see my screen? Yep. Okay, yes. good. I, I, yeah, I don't know if people in a room can on that little tiny TV you guys got, but okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, again, I'm Rob Bennett, Division 12 over in uh, what is right now, at least uh, sunny Erie, Pennsylvania. We're gonna to talk today about transporting transformers. I model uh, the mid 1950s, late 1950-ish. And I've been in a transformer business for about 35 years, almost my entire career. So I know a little bit about transformers and I wanted to have a factory on my layout. And I decided eventually over some, a bunch of changes, that's a whole nother presentation, to, to model the Westinghouse Sharon Transformer Factory uh, in the mid-1950s. So what we're going to see today is an operational overview and a sampling of the motive power and the rolling stock that you might have seen at the plant from, the, uh, let's say, the late 30s into the early 60s. That's kind of where I stop. And there's a little bit toward the end, a little bit of modeling information as well. And I will uh, give out my email address. I do have a handout that I'll be glad to email to anybody. Um, you guys can put it on your Division 8 website if, if you wish. Not a problem whatsoever. It can be anywhere it wants to be. All right. So, again, that is an actual logo uh, from the 1950s from Westinghouse. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to look at very quickly. the fact. And, and by the way, let me uh, just say that if I talk too long, just tell me to shut up. Or, or get off. It doesn't matter. I, I get it. I know you guys have a time schedule and whatnot. So I, I tend to be long and pretty verbose, but I'll, I'll try to be very quick. All right. So we're going to about the overview, where it is, where is Sharon, and a very brief history of the operations there. We're going to talk about the motive power from the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, the Sharon plant was served by the E&P off of the Pensy. We'll talk about the rolling stock from the Pensy. Who, who had the, the, the lion's share of the rolling stock that you would see there? non pensy rolling stock, and then Westinghouse rolling stock. And then I guess it's some modeling stuff that we'll throw there at the end. And these are all from, most of these at least, are from official Westinghouse Sharon photographs uh, from the company photographer that I was able to come across. I'd be remiss if I didn't have an acknowledgement screen. This is, you don't have to read this. This is people that I, that you know, none of this comes out, you know, by yourself. So these are all the folks in the books and whatnot that helped me. I do want to call out Mr. Bill Filson at the Mercer County Historical Society, where I got all the photographs and my YouTube channel, where you can see another presentation that I have. It's called Power Transformer Basics. That covers more of the, the transformers themselves, what they are, the power grid, what's on a transformer, shell form versus core form, et cetera. So it's a little bit more involved, but it is on the website. You can look at it. This is the handout I, I alluded to earlier that I just updated. Uh, I, I, again, I'll be glad to email it to folks if they're interested in it. My email is at the end. You can write that down. Uh, or I did email a copy over to, uh, to Russ and Ron and Fred. And my YouTube channel. I'll, we'll get to that at the end. All right, so factory overview. It's in far western Pennsylvania, not too far, about an hour south of here, in the city of Sharon, Pennsylvania. It's been, it was in operation from 1922-ish to about 1985 as Westinghouse. It's still, it's still there. The peak employment was around 10,000. During World War II, they, like a lot of places, they reconverted it. They made torpedoes. Um, they made tanks. And they made the vacuum tanks for the atomic bomb program, which I thought was pretty interesting. The plant itself was served by the Pennsylvania on the, off the E and P in the Erie and Pittsburgh. The Erie Railroad was right below it and the Newcastle branch served one end of it. And the New York Central also came into Sharon 
uh, out of the Youngstown, PA, uh, Youngstown, Ohio area. The Pennsylvania performed the switching for the New York Central. And of course, and obviously the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie, not obviously, but they did. They had trackage rights on the Erie Newcastle branch where they ran some coal trains. Where on earth is Sharon? Well, if you can see this, here's Sharon. Here's Erie up here. Here's Pittsburgh down here. So it's roughly midway in between, right over near the Ohio border. There, there's the border, if you can see the little dashed line, and there is Sharon itself. This is an aerial view of the plant. This is a busy picture, so I won't go through all of this, but this is basically the south is down at the bottom. The north is at the top. You have the main factory itself. You have some offices here in the middle, which are the engineering drafting offices, a cool water tower on top of the plant. The main assembly aisle comes up here. This is a new test facility that was put in in the, I'd say the mid late fifties. This yellow line is Clark Avenue. That runs right in the middle of the plant, right through it. Down below it is, was no longer there, Mercer Tube. The Erie Railroad, this has Erie like I want it, but it was really there, originally the Erie. Their Ferona Yard was down here. They came up on the back side underneath the e &P, which is right along here from south to north. This is the Erie. They serve the, let's call it the south end of the plant. The main transformers are they shipped out of the north end of the plant off of the e &P, which is up here. This is just a kind of a, a diagram out of that. This is actually out of the Erie Railroad diagrams that show the plant. This is the plant itself. Here's the EMP that comes along. This is the Newcastle branch. It sneaks by here from the middle to over to the left end. And then they serve, again, the south end of the plant. This is the north end of the plant where the Pennsylvania Railroad via the EMP came in. And this is just a blow up of that that shows the various accoutrements that are in the plant itself. This view here, again, a little bit closer up. Um, this shows the plant in eh, mid 1940s or so. This is the, again, the engineering drafting office. This is the main entrance right down here. This is Mercer Tube, which is gone. This is Erie's Ferona Yard. And I think that's the roundhouse and the turntable down there. And then this over here on the right is in the 1960s, where you can see things have been changed, some things have been raised, some things have been moved. Now we're used to that kind of stuff. And again, Clark Avenue runs right here down the right down the middle of the plant. This is a current view from Google. This is you know looking to the north is to your left. You can see the plant. This is the new facility right here. Here's Clark Avenue comes right through it. This is the former Mercer tube down below it. This is now Wheatland tube. So this is still in existence today. The old EMP came along here from south to north, and they served the north end of the plant here. This is the, which is currently the Norfolk Southern Ferona Yard, but it was the Erie, it's Erie Lackawanna. And then their Newcastle branch comes off over here and goes underneath the EMP. And again, they serve the south end of the plant. So let's talk real quick about the motive power. Um, I did get a lot of information from uh, Jerry Brighton's site, which is a great site if you want information on the Pensy. So this is a Pennsylvania Railroad. I can't, oh, there's B6, number 9097. The upper left is a photograph at the plant. If you see SH, that is an actual Sharon photograph that I got when I was at the Mercer County Museum. The right-hand side here is just, it's that locomotive, but it's not at the plant. But it's it's hard to find these old steam locomotives, photos of them. So I, I found one on the inlet somewhere, and that is a one of the uh, B6 locomotives. They use the B6 and the B6S as well. It's another steam locomotive at the plant. This is again on the north side. Clark Avenue is right over here behind the tender on this engine. This is the another B6, B6S at the plant, number 7450. That is a shell tra a laid over shell transformer on a depressed flat car. And B6SA. Number 6227. This is a cool model. This, you'll notice it's 6227. Just keep that in mind. 
And then you'll see the ND cam in behind it. We'll see again another. There's a New York Central uh, depressed car with a shell transformer on it. And then what I did, I found that model in HO scale and had it renumbered. This is a key import model, brass engine, that I did not do myself. I don't have the skill to do this. I sent it out. They added DCC sound, weathered it, renumbered it from, I think it was number three. And now it is 6227, just like what's, what's in the plant. And it's got, uh, it's been weather, DCC sound with a keep alive. This little puppy will run forever. It's a great little locomotive. The B28S number 7011, this photograph will be here from 1950, late in the 50s, late in 1950. This happens to match the Proto 2000 060 heritage locomotive. And they have that, the exact same number. And it's Walther's 920-60303. However, you will notice this has the low side tender where the photograph of it shows it with a high with a different tender. There is GE44 Tunner that was there at the plant. This is in the late 40s, 1949, probably right after it came out. It did work in the plant for a while. Now, this locomotive, you can, you can get it from Bachman, or right now you can also get it pre-order through Rapido. And they do have an Apensi, but they don't have the 9350. So I do have one on order, but I'm going to have to renumber it to 9350. But it's coming. There's no there's no due date yet, but it's it's in the works. There's the EMD SW1 or the ES6 in the Pensi parlance. Uh, there's some modeler's notes here and some references to different things, but they switched to this locomotive, I think mid 50s into the early 60s. This was used at the plant. So here's a photograph of a Schnabel car, 1961. It's like, why in the world to show this? Well, if you look way over here in the far corner, I enlarged it. That's definitely an S1. So that, that is there at the plant as late as 1961. Rolling stock. All right, this gets, this gets involved. This is the F, a Pensy F22. Uh, with, a, with a large power transformer on it. And you can see I, I zoomed in and pulled out the information off the car. This is available as a Fanaro kit. There's an F23, which is also a Fanaro kit. And this is another Westinghouse photograph. You'll notice this older, these signs are all over these cars. I call this sign the pre-war. I think this was used up to and maybe you've at the very beginning of world war ii and then they changed it and i'll show you that in a moment what they changed it to uh to another one then they changed it to a different logo then they changed it to a different logo to what they have today which you recognize as the westinghouse which is called a circle w by the way this is an f23 uh there is a much better photograph in that e and p book that i referred to earlier but that is at the plant this is an FGR from the Pensy with uh, five small transformers on it. And you can see the G44 Tutter is sticking in the right-hand side of the photograph. This is an FGRA. And this is, this is not in the plant itself. This is being delivered somewhere out west. And here is the, like I said, this is the sign that was used. I'm, I'm going to say it's during the war, and I call one pre-war, one post-war. but that you'll see that all over the car. You'll see that you'll see the do not hump sign on them. Uh, they're, they're very, very popular back then. Nowadays, you don't see that as much, but back in the time they did. This is an FM flat car. Again, it was pre-war with the, the older circle W on it. So, uh, one transformer, probably bushings and then loads of oil uh, in drums on the car itself. So you can load up these if you're modeling something with a smaller load, and, and I'll show some of that later on. You can put other accoutrements on the rail car as well. Another FM. This is probably the other two units that went along with the previous photograph of the single unit. Another FM. So FMs were fairly well used over there at the plant. And another FM. <laughs> See, again, this has got two transformers on it. Poly bushings in a crate here in the center. The sign on the left and some other accoutrements on the car itself. 
and the arch bar trucks. That's really cool. And again, another FM with uh, four smaller units. Again, probably pre-war, again, because of the, the older sign on it. And FM, and again, not all shipments on these were large, as you saw by the previous photographs. This is a small little network transformer, 300, only a 300 kVA, going to Eastern Maryland utilities. And there's probably three of these on this car. You see right here, you can see another tie down that ties it down to the car. This is just a cool picture. This is not at the plant, but it is a Pensy FM with an Aulis Chalmer. So you can see this has got three Aulis Chalmers units, and you can see how they're tied down. And again, there's the sign from the Aulis Chalmer Transformer Division in Pittsburgh. This is a Pensy F30 loaded up with cart. This, this is part of another shipment that's right behind it. We're going to see a photograph in a moment. These are all the bushings and accoutrements. This is going international, by the way, but it's shipping to a port somewhere. But often on these flat cars, you will see, in addition to transformers, a lot of other material. An entire car here loaded up with accessories going to the customer. This is another F30 with a mobile transformer. You can tell that it's got, you know, the title's a trailer. There's a gentleman here on the left, all the nice, cool little wood cribbing. These mobile transformers really beg to be modeled. Um, I haven't done one yet, but I would like to. There's another one on another F30 inside the Sharon plant. And another one, I think is the same one as before from the other side of it, looking at it. This is the mobile transformer. Mobiles are basically, there's everything on these from all kinds of windings, tap changers, series parallel boards. They're, they're basically mobile substations. They'll roll them in when there's an issue, and they'll use them in all over the network if they can. So they're, they're very, very, very interesting pieces of equipment. Then you get the F29. This is, of course, this is available from Fenaro as a kit or from Railworks, a brass model. This is probably in the 30s. This is the cars, the two cars. I believe these are the, what are they called? Kissel trucks, I believe is what they're called. You can get those, I think, with the Fenaro kit or the Buckeye trucks, which we'll see in a minute. Now, uh, these transformers, look at the cribbing. These are really cool. Again, this has uh, got the pre-war logo here. This thing on top is a shipping cover. That's not the cover that goes on it out in the field. That was just put on it for shipping. Here's another one, another close-up. And again, another shipping cover on the top there. And another one with two units on it, all the cribbing. That looks, that is so cool. And another car. This one's got the Buckeye trucks on it um, and two Transformers tied down and the older Westinghouse sign on it. Another one with Buckeye trucks, two units on it. This is an Pensy F36 flat car with a laid over shell unit on it. I've been trying to get an F36 for the longest time. Railworks does make them in brass, um, but I can't find one. They're probably on people's shelves all over the place, but I can't, I can't find one. But that's a laid over shell transformer. It's a 333 MVA, 50 hertz going to France. And right in front of it, right there, you can see on the front, that is the other flat car, the Pensy F30, that had all the boxes and crates and whatnot on it. There's probably three or four of these going out because uh, it's only a single phase unit. So it might be going out to be part of a, you know, a three phase bank. So it would be three units and maybe one is a spare. This is a Pensy FD1, number 470240, photographed in August of 52, coming out of the, the main high bay in Sharon. And this is kind of cool. I saw this picture of this little mobile in a cart. And then I looked over here and said, oh, what is that? Boop. Oh, look at that. It's a Pensy uh, boxcar. Well, it's not dated, but it is a Pensy X38 boxcar that is available as a Fanaro kit. So they would probably bring it in lumber, you know, for the structure support of the transformer. And that's why it's in the high in the bay itself at Sharon. The ND cabin, that seems to be the, the caboose of choice that was up there. You can see various photographs of it. Here it is with the GE44 tonner, 
with the steam engine and there it is hauling out that fd1 but again it doesn't show up specifically because the guys taking these pictures weren't model riveters but if you look you'll see it in various photographs this is a Fanaro kit um i'm not sure you can get it in brass or not i i don't know i, I do have the Fanaro kit in a tote with like a thousand other kits that i haven't built yet okay other railroads eerie this is an eerie depressed car with a now take a note of that transformer that's that's pretty pretty plain looking but it looks pretty cool um uh, two trucks each end the press flat car uh, built by the Erie 168 ton there's another car again another transformer coming out shell form transformer you can tell by the base uh, and then there there's the box with the Westinghouse sign and this one's going to Con Ed if you looked at the far end it's another power transformer for Con Edison so they, they would sign these uh, it, it's it's really cool to to be in that era when you can actually do this to your models. This is another Erie flat car, another large transformer, again, with a shipping cover. And here's the, here's the actual cover for the transformer on this flat car behind it. And that is this series of cars built in Illinois. That's a 70 ton, 50 ton car. That right there would go on, this shipping cover would come off and this would go on top. So in addition to having the large power transformer shipments, you should have a, a flat car or two with either the, the real cover, other boxes, bushings, cooling equipment, whatever else may be going along with the transformer itself. This is the Erie 7261 uh, being welded down. Again, here's the post, I call it post-war uh, with everything on it. You can tell they're welded, they got bottles on it, probably nitrogen and acetylene and whatnot. You know, they're welding that transformer down. Now, this particular car, which is in series 7260 to 7265, you can get really, really soon from Class 1 Model Works. This is the actual car. This is from their website. I, I do have this one on pre-order. However, this car has roller bearing trucks where the actual car itself has got the solid or the friction bearing trucks. But they do say... They're going to make other versions after this first run with the friction bearing or the solid bearing, however what you want to call it, trucks. So, and they're going to make them available separately. So that's that's pretty cool. But this car is, a, and that's a 7265, same series as the one just shown. This one I have a hard time figuring out. It's an Erie car, but I looked and, and I can't find it in the ORER. I asked some Erie experts, and, and they can't figure out what it is, but it's kind of neat. It's a short car, obviously, two transformers on it. It looks like sister units post-war because of the sign that's on it. It just, I don't know what this car is. I, I can't figure it out. I need an Erie person that's a, a real Erie expert to tell me. Another Erie flat car, arch bar trucks on it. And again, it's got a bunch of smaller transformers, probably pre-war because of the logo on it. Hey, hey, Rob. Yes, sir. Uh, Russell here. I'm sorry to to uh, interrupt that. I, I just mm -hmm. had. Could you go back? Uh, could you go back a couple of slides? Uh, one I want to stop, Russ. One more. There you go. Oh, uh, well, there you go. Uh, um, those look very tall. Uh, you know, one would think, and maybe it's just the angle, but um, and I guess you'd have no way of knowing, but one would think those are tall enough that they should be on a on a depressed flat um you, you know for height and and then i'm uh, out of all these that you know i would think with those two transformers on it that um it would be a a, a stouter car but obviously not so uh any comment on on either of those observations the only thing I can say is, is again, obviously they didn't exceed the capacity of the car. Yeah. Um, I would think the shipping department of Sharon knows that. And the height, height is a big issue. You are right. But wherever this was going, uh, the, the Erie had pretty general had pretty generous clearances, but they must not be high for the way it's going. I'm sure they checked the clearance and this can't be too high. If it was too high, you know, going to hit a bridge or something like that. It, it, it wouldn't be on this car. You're right. It'd be on the press car, but 
I've seen that before. I've seen what looked like, and, and you're right, it may be the angle, the way the gentleman's standing taking a photograph. It looks like it's too high, but I have to assume they have the clearances correct for where the car is going. That's all I can say. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you. Sure. Okay, last Erie car. Again, two more units on it. Um, a little bit longer car. This is a 70-ton car. Uh, again, built it out in Illinois. And then the New York Central System. Oh, Rob, can we stop? Yes. One second. We have a question here in the room. Sure, go ahead. When these tall shipments are moved, were they special movement with a special train rather than put in a normal freight train? It, it depends. Some were, uh, some were not. Some, if they were within the clearances on the car itself, like the one we're looking at now, which is a New York Central car, it, it probably could go on regular train service. The other car is that maybe over height or, or very, very close to height or width. Uh, the length is probably, you know, they're flying because they fit in the car. They could be in special train. There were some special trains that were run just with high and wides. Uh, so that is certainly possible. Um, it, it's a cool thing to model on your layout because I have a couple of transformers that are high and wide, I call them, and you got to run nice and slow, and they're individual runs, uh, you know, with, with an engine and a caboose in my era. So it, it, it does depend on the height and the width of the car uh, and the weight. I mean, that depends too. The weight can be a factor as well. If it's a really heavy transformer uh, or other load going somewhere, it may indeed be a special run. Continue on here. This is again, this is the closest thing I can come to this would be the exact rail car, which the, now the exact rail car is kind of a fooby, but it's 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 a not not a bad looking depressed car. It's a shorter car like this. Um, there is no exact model of this particular car itself, but that you might be able to backdate an exact rail car and it can be a really good stand in. Now, here's a, a typical New York Central car that is available from in brass. And this is close, again, to the, the, the class one model works. I'm hoping in the second run, they may release a New York Central car or two. Now, that'd be pretty nice. And again, this has got the solid bearing, friction bearing, uh, bearings on the car. Here's a mobile on two New York Central flat cars. These are very, very similar to the Intermountain cars. I have, I have a bunch of these on the layout. Yeah, Intermountain ready to run. They, they, they make a nice New York Central car. Actually, they make a lot of nice of these 70 ton flat cars. Here's another angle of it. Again, with a mobile transformer. I, I got to get a, a model of a mobile. I don't know how to do it, but it, it just looks so cool. And this one I just threw, that's the same car as before because of the freight station. You know, if you saw that on someone's layout, with a big New York Central logo and right on the top, you go, that's not prototypical. What is that garbage? Like, well, there it is. You know, there's the picture of it. So I, I just think that's a cool picture. Now, this one is kind of a mystery. This is an official Sharon photograph by Westinghouse at the Westinghouse plant, but it's the New York Central technical research car. Because there's a transformer and a gentleman there in a suit at the, on the flat car. Why that car is a Sharon, I have no idea. But there you go. It's your layout. If you want to put a passenger car in one of your factories, go for it. Reading lines, they showed up. This is another laid over shell transformer on one of the Reading heavy duty flat cars. Uh, they're a class FWD. Uh, they had only five cars built in 1928. And again, I don't know if this is similar to the, again, to the class one model works car, but it's very, very similar. CNO got involved as well, of course. This is a six axle straight deck flat car. Pretty cool looking with a really, really neat looking transformer. That is a furnished unit for Shea Chemical Company in 1956. That is just the coolest looking thing. Again, that just begs to be modeled. And again, obviously, it fits on a straight deck car with the clearance and the heights and everything and the widths. Um, it, it's just a cool looking unit. And here's the 
the box on the left hand side with the bushings in it, most likely, and a cool gentleman there waving to everybody. And here is another CNO flat with uh, six metering transformers. Um, I'm pretty sure I got what that car is. It is in this one particular book. You can find that car. And there's a very nicely dressed young fellow there on the end of the car. Man, he looks good. Okay, the Milwaukee Road got in as well. You don't have to read all that. I understand. It's just, it's an, it's, this is probably a custom car. You, you won't find an inner mount or anything like that. That's really close to it. But it's got three, I think, CSP transformers on it. Southern Railway, they were in this one particular picture. Again, there's a Southern flat car, crates on it, and another flat car in front of it with a bunch of crates. That is the actual diagram of that freight car, of that flat car, excuse me. The B&O got involved, or at least the one that I could find was this particular. I didn't know what this was, but I saw it. it's in the background of another picture, and it's got lumber in it. So again, it looks like it's kind of beat up stuff, becoming this dunnage or what it is. But uh, Mr. Eric Hansman, I forget what presentation I was giving up. Oh, was this to another group? And he got back to me with information. This is an 028 because you can't see the rest of the car. So I don't know what the what the class of it was, but he got back and said, oh, yep, that's what it is. I said, oh, okay, cool. The bear and who, who, who the hell is this? But there it is. There's there's a flat car from the Bear and Chelsea, which is a really small railroad up in uh, New England, with a CSP, which is a completely self protecting transformer on it. You know how this got to the plant? There's only fifty of these. This is the actual information from the January fifty three ORER on that railroad. Yeah, and there they are. There's fifty of them. Uh, this railroad only had like I don't know, it was like six miles long or something like that, but. Hey, that flat car got into Sharon somehow and got loaded. Now, this is this is pretty cool. This is from the Bonneville Power Authority. And I saw this is an official Westinghouse picture. I saw this and I'm looking at it like, the heck's that? Is that going overseas? And they had this thing. And why is the why is the car labeled Bonneville Power and not Erie or New York Central or Pensy or anything like that? There's the car from the other side. It's got the cooling equipment. Ready, this is ready to be shipped, but if you notice, the transformer is tied down to the rail car. Huh. Okay, just some more information. Checked on again, checked on the uh, on the O on the O R E R what that car was. Talked about it. I did some more digging, and this is it actually built uh, down at Greenville it, uh, from Mr. Scott Woods, who has builder photos of this particular car. And that is the that is what they did with it. They actually had a spare transformer on a flat car, and now here, here it is dressed in a substation. So I guess they could very carefully haul this thing around to different substations, like a gigantic mobile, as they needed it. It's it's really cool. So that that would be a really interesting model because you could have it, you know, shipping out or fully assembled you know, hauled around somewhere. And I, I'm sure you have to be really careful when you move this because it looks over wide. Because here you can see all the cooling has been installed. It's got all the bushings on it. So it's, it's going to be fully dressed, but that's a pretty cool load. Westinghouse got in the deal. This car is a Westinghouse depressed car, fully riveted. It, it just begs to be modeled, but I can't figure out who built it. Or and This is definitely going to be a scratch building project. Uh, to make this thing. Um, but it's a short car, depressed. Um, there's three of them. Westinghouse had three of these cars. See, there's another one way. This is in the background of another photograph. You can barely see it, but that's the Westinghouse car there in the back. Look at all those rivets. And hey, this is a cool looking car. There is a builder's plate that I can hardly hardly read, but it's it's there. They have a, a well car. That was probably used in the plant, you know, to move things around inside the plant. Um, but they're there. They, they are listed and marked in the ORER. And this is from January 59, the different Westinghouse cars. Now, this is the very first Schnabel car. 
in August of 1957. It's going to Ohio Power in West Virginia out of the Sharon plant. Westinghouse was the first manufacturer in the United States, at least, to design the Schnabel car. It was built by Greenville Car Company down in Greenville, Pennsylvania, shipped up to Sharon. And this is the first movement of a transformer in that car. There it is just across Clark Avenue. And there's our favorite little GE 44 tonner. There's the color photograph. I, I did the best I could, but this is a, from a modern railroads magazine cover. But I wanted the colors because you can get, oh, I'm, I, I just added this. This is the actual way bill for that movement that, believe it or not, is in the most recent B&O Sentinel. It's in volume 45, number three, from third quarter of 2023. It is the way bill for that car. Um, me and some of my friends, we don't know how it was routed. Obviously, the PRR picked it up because the, the uh, G44 Tonner has it. It probably went to the New York Central uh, down at the Ferona Yard down below it, and then it was switched out by the New York Central to the B&O, but we don't know where. But we think it, it would have gone up the Youngstown line into Ashtabula over to Cleveland. And then from there, maybe down the B&O Lake Branch, we're not sure. But obviously, this has got some dimensional requirements on it because of the size of it. This is the car itself. You can get it in HO scale. It's, uh, right, it's uh, from Concept Models. It's a resin kit. I do have it. I haven't built it yet. Here are the trucks down at uh, in Greenville on flat cars, probably be going to Sharon. And here is a diagram. I have the actual diagrams for the car um, and a lot of photographs. Westinghouse down in Mercer County has got a lot of photographs of this particular car. Um, so that, that's pretty cool. And I, and I will build it eventually in HL scale. Here they both are. The second car that came out after the 200, which was built in 657, was this 201 larger. It came out in early 61. So those are the, both those cars sitting there, probably, you know, mid 60s. They're sitting there at the plant because you can see the sign is different and the circle W is different. That's, that's kind of the more modern logo on it. All right, some custom stuff that I've done, and we'll get into the modeling part of this, then I'll shut up. This over here are some of the flat cars, Erie cars, CNO car, Reading car. I have had custom decals made up and custom signs for the transformer made up and custom placards. There's the Alice Chalmers, GE Pittsfield, because I worked for GE most of my career. There's that Con Edison sign to go on a unit. These are all available, or yeah, I think all of these are available, as a matter of fact, at cmrproducts.com. If you go into their decals and look under Westinghouse, I paid to have the artwork done on these. I get nothing for it, but they're there. You can buy them uh, at any scale. They can do it for you. And they can do it as, as uh, not deals, as decals um, or as vinyl stickers. I got tired, of, to be honest, I got tired of taking these cutting them out as decals and decaling them onto a little piece of styrene or piece of wood and then use them as the sign. So they said they can make them as vinyl and I got them as a vinyl sticker. It's a lot easier to peel off and stick on when you're making the signs for the, for, for the cars. Okay, this is my factory. Uh, it's not a hundred, it's not anywhere near correct, but it's what I had room for. That's what I did. This is the factory here in the back. Uh, these are I-T-L-A, imagine that laser art, like a four-inch section. I think there's there's a bunch of them all put together, glued together. It's all interior. Uh, it's got it's got the <laughs> a titchy water tower on it. This is the other view of it. it as it does have an oil factory and kerosene coming here. This is the high bay for manufacture. And here's some loads that one will show in a moment. So this up here, upper left, is the engineering slash drafting offices. This is a Monster Model Works kit that I had. So I put it in there because it looks like it's, it's, it looks cool there. This is the main assembly building. Obviously not nearly as big as it should be, but I custom cut two roll-up doors here where the cars can come in and out. I cut here where you can come in 
on the side of the high bay. This, I believe, is a Walf, part of a Walther's gantry crane that I glued to the building to load up mobile units, right? Actually, eventually build one. I have a weld track. Again, here's one of those exact rail cars that I just weathered up. This is where they would bring units in uh, to weld them up. And for an off session, it's there to be kind of be in the way. You have to move around it when you're switching the plant. And this is the track. It runs way over here. You can see it. It runs up to a mirror, but it's supposed to be the Erie interchange track. There's my cell phone <laughs> peeking down the side over there. But I can bring in Erie engines if I want to, or Erie cars when they say, okay, they're coming off the Erie to go into the plant. This is the oil facility, oil slash kerosene facility. Transformer manufacturers use kerosene when they did what they call vapor phase of transformers. It was a process, they tried them out. Very, very good process. So that's my tank farm that has the mineral oil that can come in or go out. Um, in, in, the, in the tanks there, and it runs into the building to do what it's got to do. So here's that one transformer. You can see it there on the right. And there's the custom one that I had built. That's a th custom 3D printed model. I measured this up best I could uh, from photographs and kind of guessed, you know, kind of knowing what it looks like. And this is the actual 3D model that a gentleman printed for me. And I do have these I think first through third. So I, I ordered three of these so I can have the first, second, and third on, on a flat car going out of the plant. This is, again, this is that large unit on the Pensy flat car, and that's my model of it. This is, a again, a Railworks FD1 flat car that I had to decal. So I, I'm amazed at myself. I actually decaled that, and it, it looks okay. I did retruck it because the trucks, you know, I, Personally, brass car brass cars are are terrible for trucks. And everything. I retrucked it with Tahoe trucks. They're probably not one hundred percent correct, but I did that. I had to recouple it, so now it runs pretty nice. This transformer is actually a Union Electric of Missouri one twenty five MVA shell transformer. I do have the outline drawing for this from Westinghouse from nineteen fifty two, so I have all the actual dimensions of that particular transformer. And here's the car to this. I just took this. Here's it is on the car. Here it is tied down. That's the 3D printed model. These tie downs actually have the Westinghouse type. They have like a spring. It was kind of spring loaded so, so they could tie it to the car and then I guess crank it to tie, the, to tie the unit down. It's got the Westinghouse sign here on the left. It's got a little box there. That's the impact recorder. That's on almost every shipment of large transformers. There's a small box over here, and there's the do not hump sign on the right-hand side. So here's another view of all that stuff. Two signs on the car, impact recorder, box, do not hump both ways. And then behind it is just a, a little uh, intermountain flat car with two large boxes tied down that, that are going along with it. And then the back, here's the other transformer on the weld car, get ready to be welded down to the car. This is a smaller load. These are six smaller units. Uh, these are available from Resin Car Works. They're available at Shapeways. That's called a transformer load. Uh, I did paint these. Again, I put them on an Intermountain car, and it's got the sign on it. It's got a box for each, each set of two for bushings. It's got the do not humps at the end. And it's got three barrels of extra top-off oil that I put on the car as well. So you can do a lot of a lot of fun stuff with these cars. And they, oh, there's the impact recorder in a box right in the middle of the car. These are three loads. These are Artitech transformers. Again, on Intermountain flat cars, the transformer is right here. There's uh, the signs again on the car. There's boxes, there's a whole crate of oil for the load. So th this has just got two transformers. This has got the, the third transformer for whatever reason, with a couple boxes, you probably for the bushings and other accoutrements, and then top off oil. These are available. Um, you can get them at eBay from seller JTG 1942 or at MB Klein, which is model train stuff, but they're out of stock at MB Klein. But you can get them from this gentleman on eBay. That's where I bought these. 
Um, and he will take deals, by the way. He'll, 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 you can make an offer and get these. Don't pay $38 for them. So they're kind of nice. This is the color that I use. This is from AK Interactive. They're a third generation paint called Strong Dark Blue. It's almost a perfect match for the GE Pittsfield and Westinghouse blue gray color that was used. I'm going to say into the into the 60s. It was used for not for all transformers, but for a lot. The reason I got this is a I'm lazy, and I didn't want to have to be mixing paints. You, you, you know, it's just oh, what a pain in the ass that is. So I initially looked for something like spray. You know, from Tamiya or from Vallejo, it didn't have anything that was close. So this is the closest thing I could find. So this does require an airbrush, but again, it's it's out of the bottle. You put it in, in, the, in the paint cup, you put a little bit of thinner, and boom, and away you go. You can airbrush all those other transformers that you saw my models were painted with that particular paint. Today, after the mid, eh, let's say mid-1960s, they kind of switched to an ANSI 70 light gray color. That's the color you see nowadays if you go out and see a transformer. You're probably going to see a light gray color. You could see ANSI 61 dark gray. ANSI 45 is the Berkshire green. So there's all kinds of different colors, and that's customer specific. So they can say what they want on their transformer. I've seen them field yellow, desert tan, um, again, different shades of gray. But if they didn't ask, most of the times back in the mid 50s, this was the color that was on those transformers. All right, real quick, then I'm done. I'll shut up. This is a quiz for everybody. There's a transformer, came out of Sharon, 4,500 KVA. It's a single phase unit. It's 132 to 12 KV. So this should be start ringing some alarm bells for people. 25 cycles. Yay, this is a transformer that went to the Pennsylvania Railroad and it was probably on the Northeast Corridor, but that, that's all I know about it. I don't know how many they were. I think it'd be a cool load to come out of Sharon to head east, so to speak, for the electrification of the Northeast Corridor. There's probably a lot of these units that went out of Sharon. But I, I don't have a date on it, but it was probably when they electrified the, the corridor. And with that, again, okay, upper right, this is the actual main entrance way back in the day, which is right down here in the corner and the sign. And with that, I will shut up. And I will, oh, there's my email. Uh, if you're interested in getting a hold of me for anything, I'll try to answer you, whatever I can. I'll answer questions right now. But I do want to show real quick, I just want to show this particular handout. I do have this. This is a handout that I made. It, it's it's kind of upper level information. It's, can, can you guys see that? It's still showing? Yeah. I, I, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Talks about the different the different eras, the different manufacturers, different tank designs you're going to see, colors, the bushing color did change, what kind of rail cars you're going to see, the different types of oil preservation. And then after that, the next several pages are HO scale models. These are the ones that, that I could find. I'm not saying they're all up to date, but these are the ones that I saw that are in HO scale that you can purchase or that are out there somewhere. Here's an Artitech unit. It's a foreign unit, but I kind of made it look American. That's the one that I have on the, those three cars. And there's a bunch. Of, you can look through here. Shapeways has got a bunch. There's other non-transformer loads. This is an oil circuit breaker. Pretty cool. I bought this and used it inside the plant as a shell transformer top. There's the three, the six resin transformers that I used as the, as the one load. They have an Alice Chalmers transformer. And then just out, you may be well aware of these. These are from Class One Model Works again. Again, excuse me. These are their, their different loads. They have a large transformer modern, which according to a, a YouTube video I just saw, I believe is out of the Federal Pacific or North American plant out in Milipitas, California. Then they have this, what they call an old transformer. This is, to me, if you look at the prototype picture for this, the nameplate on it, Sure looks like a GE nameplate, um, but they're they're actually fairly good models. Now this one I'll probably I, I I have two of these coming as a matter of fact. I just got the email yesterday. They're in. Um, 
I'll paint them the strong dark blue, put them on a rail car, tie them down, and just either have them go near the plant for repair or I don't know. I, I just like them. So, so I got those. So this is available for anyone that may be interested. I believe I did send it to some of the gentlemen on the call. Again, you can put it on your website, get a hold of me. Uh, whatever's easiest for you, I can certainly get it out to you. And there's my email address. So we'll be sending this out to all our members. With That's us. great. Yep. Okay. In, in your That's behalf. Fine. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. yeah any questions? Feel free to email me later. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I understand it's, it's getting late in the day now and whatnot, but I'll never of course, as Rob says, he's available to answer your questions by email. If you miss his email, you can catch it on the YouTube video when it comes up. Or we'll send it out to you when we send out his uh, amendum sheet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Rob, it's a great clinic. Thank you very much. Rob, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time today. We we sure appreciate it. And uh, I'll be sending you something that uh, uh, of all the presenters at the, the Division 8, and I know I've given one uh, to your group uh, a couple of years ago. So uh, uh, if you can call on us, uh, uh, we'll be glad to return the favor. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Well, thank Thanks you very Rob. much, Rob. Yep. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. You're, you're quite welcome. Anytime. Okay. Meeting officially adjourned.